Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. Please, if you haven't told your chess friends about my channel, Dan Heisman Chess, please do that. That's even better than liking the video or subscribing. Not that you shouldn't do those things too, but if you haven't done that, uh, take a few seconds, and next time you go to the club or a tournament or whatever, maybe mention the channel. Okay. Today we're going to talk a little bit about hand waving and we've had a couple videos on this before and my thought process videos have done very well. People like the idea of trying to improve their thought process. So let's start out and let's say white plays a move like a3 here and you have to make a move. Do you need to analyze the position? Well, it depends on your definition of analyze. If your definition of analyze means think about it, well, of course you're going to think about it. But if your definition of analyze means if I go there and he goes there and I go there and he goes there, then what's what's going to happen and what's the evaluation? You don't really need to analyze this position. You could analyze it with respect to the fact that white has basically said, I don't want to play white, you play white. And then you could analyze and say, well, if I'm playing white and he has a, a3 in, I can't play the Roy Lopez because if I play e5, e4, knight f6, knight c3, then bishop to b4 is not going to be possible, and I can't play a reverse Roy Lopez. But other than that, you're really not analyzing the position. You're just using your judgment on what you want to do to try to bring out your pieces. Do you want to play e5 here? Do you want to play d5? Do you want to fianchetto on the king side and, and castle very quickly? Do you want to play knight f6 to try to hit the center? You know, you can kind of use your judgment on what you want to do. You don't have to worry about whether your moves are safe. All your moves are going to be safe. So in a sense, this is what we would call a non-analytical position or a judgmental position. And when you're using your judgment to find a move in a position like this, it's perfectly okay. And I call the idea of using principles instead of analysis to kind of hand wave. And I mean hand wave in a kind of a bad way, meaning that you should analyze in some positions. But if you said to me, Dan, can we use the word hand wave in this position and say it's okay to hand wave Black's move? I would say, yes, in that sense, hand wave is not an error. It's just a way of thinking when you're using judgment. Just like if you have a double attack that doesn't win material because your opponent can defend the double attack, in that case, the double attack is not a tactic. When the double attack does win material, then it is a tactic. So double attacks are sometimes tactics, sometimes not tactics. Hand waving can be considered an error if you're not supposed to do it, but if, it, if you do it in a position like this, it's okay. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was I was watching a video by Coach Andres, and he was talking about what I call hand-waving, but he called it telling a story. And of course, it's the exact same kind of problem, but it was just a different name that he used. And I wanted to show you the, the opening where that happened, and I'll tell you where he was talking about telling a story. So in the game he was looking at, white played d4, knight f6, c4, Benoni. White played d5, black played modern Benoni instead of the Benko Gambit. He played e6, Benko Gambit would be b5. <clears throat> knight c3, pawn takes, pawn takes d6. And now white should probably play something like <clears throat> knight f3. White played e4, which is okay. Black plays g6, and now white should get ready to castle. He should play something like knight f3 and then bishop e2 or bishop d3, but white wasted a tempo. He has a perfectly good place to put his bishop. Instead, he fianchettos his bishop into the white pawns, and it's going to be hard to get those pawns out of the way. So that extra tempo it's going to take him to get his pieces out, as well as the fact that bishop's not good there, means that this is not a main grandmaster line. So black, notice the difference in the bishops. This bishop is going through the dark squares, which are completely open and makes that bishop really strong, especially since the white d-pawn has already gone past the d4 square, so that black has less contesting on those dark squares in the center. White's bishop, on the other hand, on g2, is going right up against his own pawns. So black castles, and now black's going to put his rook on d8 and start attacking the e-pawn, and white needs to worry about that pin on the e-file since he's not castled yet. So the right move here is to play knight on 1 to e2 to not worry about any fighting business after rook to e8, and then he can castle. Instead, white played knight f3, which blocks his bishop from guarding the e-pawn. And now when black plays rook e8, 
He's threatening to win a pawn, and white can't castle because of knight takes e4, winning a pawn. So white needs to make a move. And what white should play here is he should guard the pawn twice more with the move knight d2. Now, you know, masters know that in this kind of position in the middle game, you often want to have your knight on c4, and knight d2 would help get there, but white wasn't that familiar with the Benoni, and he wasn't aware of that idea. So he thought maybe it'd be a better idea rather than moving the knight twice and blocking the bishop to just develop another piece. So he played queen to c2, which is a little bit dangerous because now black has ideas. For instance, in some lines, black could play knight takes e4, knight takes e4, and then f5, pinning the knight, getting the knight back with, with some play. I'm not saying that that's the best move. In fact, we could turn on the engine here, Mr. Stockfish. Do you like knight takes e4? Engine says, no, it's not a good move. The engine says you should play b5 here. The idea of b5 is if the knight takes it, then black already is able to take on e4. And otherwise, you're threatening to remove the guard with b4, and white's already got problems. In fact, the computer said white's winning. White should just give up the e-pawn. It says the best line is castle b4, knight somewhere, knight b5. And then black can take the pawn. Let's say knight takes e4, and white's losing already. All right, that's the best line, but of course, this is an amateur game. So in black, instead of the clever b5, plays bishop f5 to attack the pawn again. And now white's pretty much forced to play knight d2 to, to guard the pawn. And the engine says white's back better again. And here black plays queen to d7, which is actually... Uh, blocks both knights a little bit, although the knight in the Benoni often goes to a6 and then c7 to support the b5 move. And now white should realize his biggest problem by far is the pin on the e-file. And the only way to really get out of that pin is to castle now while he can. And then everything would be hunky-dory. But in this position, white, who was, you know, not a super strong player, thought that the bigger problem was that the queen and the bishop were forming a battery, and if he castles, black could play bishop to h3 and threaten to trade off the bishop that's around his king, and he thought that was the bigger problem. A good player would look at this and kind of laugh and say, no, that's not even a problem, much less a bigger problem than the pin on the e-file. The pin on the e-file on a scale of 0 to 100 for problems is like a 78, and if you castle and black plays bishop h3, it's like a, well, it's not really even a problem, so maybe it's around a 0. But, of course, that takes judgment, it takes experience, and, you know, Black thought that it might be a problem if, if he did that. So, in the other video, uh, the White had told Coach Andras that, you know, I was worried that if I castle, he could play Bishop h3, and then, then maybe he could get a kingside attack. And sure, if you take the Bishop on h3 and let him play Knight to g4, there's some lines where you could be in trouble, but no, it's not checkers, you're not forced to take that Bishop on h3. So after you castle, if he plays bishop h3, you can just kind of ignore it. And there's no real problem. And that's where Coach Andres was talking about telling a story. He said, you know, White really didn't analyze many moves. He analyzed one, one move deep or two-ply deep. He looked at castle, bishop h3, and he just stopped there and said, I don't like the looks of that. Well, sometimes good players can look one move deep and say, I don't like the looks of that. But what Coach Andres was saying was basically, you shouldn't just tell a story there. You need a line where you're in trouble. So he says, you need to analyze the position. In my terminology, I would say, you don't want to be so superficial in your analysis. You don't want to hand wave it and just say, that looks bad. You want to say, what if I do this? Can he win a pawn or can he mate me? Or you know, can he get a big attack that I can't stop? And the problem is, if you castle and black plays bishop h3, then if you look over here at the engine, which of course my student doesn't have an engine, you can see his top five moves all give him at least a half a pawn advantage. It's not like White's in danger and if he does the wrong thing, he's going to get mated here. He's got lots of reasonable moves that he could play. In fact, the engine even likes the interesting move F3, which further blocks the bishop, but it overprotects the e-pawn to free up all those other pieces to do their work. And it says white has a much bigger than opening advantage. In fact, white's almost winning this position with a, with a plus one. Well, okay, we could say that white misevaluated the position, but he did more than misevaluate it. He actually hand waved it in such a way that, that he, he 
didn't really find any lines where he was in trouble. He just stopped and said, I don't like the looks of that. And that's okay, and as I said, in some cases. But he really hand-waved the position when you really have to look at lines. And there's just no lines here where White's going to be in trouble unless he actually tries to help. I mean, for instance, if you took the, the bishop on h3 and the queen took, you'd need to be able to guard h2 on the next move. Now, the engine says just play f3 to keep the knight out, and you're still doing great. But you'd have to do something really bad here. You could play knight c4, and then he could play knight g4, and now all of a sudden with the knight not going to f3, now if you try to guard the pawn with the queen, now black's going to check, and now things are deteriorating very quickly. Uh, you can't play anything to e3 because he's got it attacked twice. If you play king to h1, the rook's not guarded. So yes, we could we could come up with a sequence of moves where white would play really badly and get into trouble, but as I said earlier, there's no reason to take that bishop, and taking that bishop is actually your third best move here, but a lot of the lines where you get in trouble is where you take the bishop and then you play poorly, but if you don't take the bishop, there's nothing to worry about. Let's say here you do play, um, you know, knight, let's say you play a4 to stop his queenside advance, and let's say he trades bishops. Can you come up with a sequence here where white's in trouble? Let's say black plays, I don't know, queen here. You can see the engine's already raising the number all the way up to 3.6. The engine says, thanks for letting me do an AWL. If you haven't seen my earlier video on AWL, an AWL is attacked with something worth less. And that not only hits the queen and makes it go away, but it also guards the e-pawn to free up the other pieces. Let's say black keeps attacking with queen h5. The problem is the queen's the only piece attacking. This knight can't help. The bishop can't help like it did in the other lines. There's nothing going on here. The engine says knight c4 hitting this pawn on d8, d6. Black has to think, uh-oh, how do I save that pawn? Let's say he tries to save it with rook d8. The engine's already thinking about trapping the queen here with h4 and moves like that, but you don't have to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Engine says you could just play something like queen f2, and it has, even though the material is even, it has white up by six pawns in this position. All right, let's go back to the game. So here, white hand-waved the fact that castling was bad when, in fact, castling would solve his biggest problem, which is that terrible pin on the e-file, and would give him a very good game. And he just, in general principle, said, I don't like to castle that bishop and the queen are pointed with a battery toward my king side. By the way, uh, I have a video on this idea of playing queen d7 and bishop h3. Uh, you can... You can, you can do a search on my channel, Dan Heisman Chess. It's called uh, the anti-Fianchetto question mark, <laughs> meaning some people think, oh, if I allow that, I'm always in trouble. You know, if I Fianchetto and they get to do that, then I'm in trouble. When in fact, that's only rarely the case. Like, and there's some opposite color castling positions like um, the, the main line in the Yugoslav dragon, or the Simish King's Indian, when you castle queen, you castle opposite sides and he's feying kettled, and you push your h pawn and then play bishop to h6 for white, where that can be a, re a regular idea. But in most cases, when you do stuff like that, especially here where you're castled on the same side, it's just no big deal. So I'm, I'll refer you to that other video if you want more information about the fact that here a move like bishop h3 is really nothing to worry about. So white not only decided that he would not castle, but he made things worse by playing h3 to keep the bishop out of h3. Why does that make things worse? Well, because he's got to castle and get out of that pin, that terrible pin, and right now he can't castle queenside. His bishop on c1 has no moves, and he can't get over there, and besides, that's not the best side of the board to castle on in this kind of opening anyway. But now he can't castle kingside, because if he castles kingside to get out of the pin, then the rook on h1 is not guarding h3 anymore, and black has two pieces on it. So here, let's make a move for black. Let's say black plays knight a6 to get the knight back to here and support b5, and white messes up in castles. Well, of course, black's just going to win the game with bishop takes h3 because white just put a pawn there to keep the bishop out, when in fact what it does is it keeps prevents you from castling. So I have, I have a name for moves like h3, I call them negative moves. 
they're negative moves because you're actually probably better off just passing and saying to Black, it's your turn, you know, just go ahead and move. Now, you could argue and say, but if you play h3, maybe later when you move the king, you're threatening to, like, trap the bishop. And the engine says, well, okay, if you play knight a6 and white plays g4, now black will use that same trick we talked about before, about f5. He would play, like, knight takes, and now you can't take the bishop because of all the discovered checks. So you take first with a knight. Let's say you take with this knight to open your bishop. He removes the guard with bishop takes c3. Let's say you take back with the queen. Engine says, just play rook takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, forking the queen and the rook. All kinds of tactics here. And of course, if the queen takes here, the coup de gras is rook to e8. And we got the first problem in the Bain book where you pin a queen to a king on the e file and white's losing. So black gets all kinds of stuff in those kind of lines. You just can't leave your king in the center. You're going to lose. I'm always telling my students, if you don't castle, you're going to get into trouble. And if, if I'm not making that a strong enough suggestion to my students, castle, 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 castle. If you play a game and you delay castling and you get into trouble, then my first thought is Dan must be a bad coach because I can't tell you how strongly castle, 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 castle. If we need to keep talking about it every lesson, castle, 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 castle. It's only the most important move in almost every opening. It's the only move that gets your most important piece out of where it's vulnerable. And it's the only move where you get to sort of develop two pieces in one move. So sometimes people say to me, I don't like to castle, I'll lose a tempo. Well, actually you could think of castling as gaining a tempo because you get to move two pieces and other moves don't. All right, so what we should do next, since we're talking about telling the story as Coach Andres called it, or hand-waving as I call it, same, basically the same thing, let's get a random position out of my library here. I'll pause the video and let's see if we can compare hand-waving with some careful analysis. Okay, I've located a game, Stein against Kolmov from 1966. Black has just played f6, hitting the knight on g5. So this is a very analytical position. So what would it mean to hand wave a position like this? Well, hand waving refers to following principles when you actually should analyze, but it also refers to what I would call very superficial analysis, like we saw in the previous example, where you really don't analyze in any depth. Like here, you could rationalize and say, that pawn on f6 is attacking the pawn on e5, and it's also attacking the knight on g5. So if I need to save both of them, the best way to do it is to just take the pawn with my pawn. And if he takes back with his pawn, I have a discovered check with the knight. And if he takes back some other way, then my e pawn isn't attacked anymore. That's analysis, but it's pretty superficial. It might be correct, but that's not the way good players play chess. And the whole idea of this video is to get you to try to visualize and analyze a little more carefully. So let's let's look at what white could actually do here. What could white do besides pawn takes? Pawn takes, let's call e takes f6 our, our number one candidate, but we're gonna have to analyze it in a little more depth. And when you see a good move, you have to look for a better one. So let's, let's think about this. So e takes f6, if you were black, which way would you take? Well, we already said taking with the pawn looks very, very dangerous. White would have moves like uh, knight to e6 check hitting the rook on f8. Um, I don't think knight f7 check is right because of queen g7, but even that might work. Who knows? But after e takes f6, black's not going to take with the pawn. But is he going to take with the rook or the queen, and does it make any difference? Well, let's say he takes with the queen to get his queen out of the corner. Well, that hits our f pawn another time, but our f pawn is guarded by the rook on f1 and the queen. Maybe if he takes with the queen, we can play queen takes h4 and threaten queen h7 checkmate. That looks awfully good. So after e takes f6, we can now start to assume that he's going to take with the rook. Well, what does that do? Well, it weakens the back rank a little and it blocks the queen in. Well, those are all good things. Um, let's take a look. e takes f6, rook takes f6. What will we do then? Well, now our knight's not attacked anymore, so we could do almost anything we want. The rook on the seventh looks good. Um, the rook on f1 is not doing too much. We could, I don't think we can push the pawn to f5, but maybe we can. Um, 
let's see, the material after e takes f6, rook takes f6. Each side has a queen, two rooks, a knight, and five pawns, so material's even. Is black threatening rook to g6? No, because the pawn guarding the knight can kind of sit there forever. Um, the knight on d4 is a very good outpost knight, but it doesn't have a lot of targets. But the rook on e8, if we take his pawn on f6, his rook on e8 becomes stronger. And then maybe after rook takes f6, maybe in some lines he can play something like rook to e2. Although then his back rank's a little weak. All right, so, so it looks like after e takes f6, rook takes f6. White doesn't have anything special. But on the other hand, he's not in, in a lot of danger either. Let's look at some other moves. Suppose we move the knight. <clears throat> Where would we go? If we go knight to f7 and he plays rook takes f7, does that get us anything? No. If we play knight to e4 and he plays f5, forking our queen and our knight, can we play knight f6 check? I don't think so because he can just play rook takes f6 and I can't take the rook with the pawn e takes f6 because his pawn on f5 is attacking my queen. So knight e4, f5, knight f6, check, rook takes f6 is no good for white. And after knight e4, f5, if I do anything else for white, black can just play f takes e4. So knight, knight e4 is no good. Knight e6 doesn't look good. On knight e6, he can take with the knight or the rook. Knight f7 hits his queen, but rook takes f7 is good. If I then play rook takes f7, king takes f7, queen d7, check. He can always just put his king back on f8 and guard his rook. Doesn't look right. Knight f3, it looks superficially safe, and it hits the pawn on h4. But what happens if he removes the guard of my pawn on e5 and plays knight takes f3, check, and then rook takes f3, check, and then e takes f6? If I play e takes f6, he has rook takes f3. Sorry, if I play e take, f takes e5, he plays rook takes f3, queen takes f3, and he could even probably play rook takes e, e5 in some lines. So now we're starting to prove by analysis that e takes f6 is the best move. We're not just doing it on general principles. And this is where maybe in a speed game and in a slow game, I might make the exact same move, but... That doesn't mean I play just as well in speed chess. It just means sometimes the, the, your first thought of what you might do is held up by analysis, and sometimes it's not. So, so far, I don't see any moves other than, than e takes f6, but let's keep looking for a minute. Uh, rook takes g7 check. He can take with the queen. I don't have a discovered attack. Um, can I move my knight somewhere where I can distract this queen away from the g7 square for mate? I don't really see it. We, as we said, knight e4, f5 forks the queen and the knight. And knight f6 check doesn't really seem to work. Um, so knight f3, we already said knight takes f3 check, rook takes f3, e take, f takes e5, seems to win a pawn. Can I move the queen like to d7 and do something down there? Queen d7, let's say he takes the knight. I'm not threatening mate. I'm not threatening a rook. I'm not threatening a knight. Doesn't look like it. How about pinning that pawn with rook to c6? No. Knight takes c6, wins the rook. So pinning that pawn on f6 with the rook doesn't work. So I'm getting more convinced that e takes f6 is the right move. Let's turn on the engine, see if that's the right move by far. Mr. Engine. Engine says, of course, Dan, you're forced to do that. And if you do, you have a big advantage. And if you don't, then you're probably losing. So that was correct. E takes F6. And now the engine says rook takes and queen takes are equally good. But we've already seen that queen takes allows queen takes H4. So even though the engine says they're equally good, a human's going to take with the rook. And that's what Komov did, even though the engine says it's slightly worse. Because he's not going to just give... Stain the pawn on h4, Leonid Stain, one of the greatest players never to become world champion. He was a member of that great Soviet bloc in the 50s and 60s where, you know, they had all, they had like, you know, 10 of the top 12 players in the world were all from the Soviet Union. 
Okay, so after rook takes f6, white played his best move, rook to c8, attacking the back rank. We could show the rest of the game. Black took, white took check. Now that knight is performing good stuff, stopping the king from coming up and tucking himself away on h7. Rook f8, only move he can play. Queen back to g4. So you say, well, what, what? the queen just came from there. What's the point? Well, part of the point is that white has things he can do here, and black doesn't have a lot he can do. So he tries knight f5, and now that rook finally gets into the game with rook e1, and his rook is now much better than black's rook. So his knight's better than black's knight, his queen's better than black's queen, his rook's better than black's rook, and his king is safer. So queen f6, keeping the rook from coming out. Queen h5, threatening mate on h7. Computer says even the obvious AWL rook e6 was good. Knight h6 blocking the mate. Rook e4 just guarding his f pawn from queen takes f4 check. Notice in the previous move, black couldn't play queen takes f4 check because knight h6 was not only blocking the mate, but it was a discovery on the pawn. White guards the pawn. Black says, I have a three on two majority on the queen side. Let's get a pass pawn over there so I can distract white from what he's trying to do to me on the king side. White says, uh, I'll hold you up for a while by guarding the c4 square. Black says, I'll hit the rook, but the knight's guarding the rook. White says, I have plenty of time. I'll just win that pawn. Thank you very much. Black says, let me trade off that really annoying knight. White plays rook e7. Computer says he has nothing better. He's up about one and a half pawns after the trade knights. Knight takes. Pawn takes. Queen d5. Queen g3. Engine says, even though black has the queen side majority, white's extra pawn and the possibility he could push the pawn on the king side is dangerous. Rook f7. White says, go ahead and take my rook. I wanted that pawn up there anyway to threaten mate, and now rook takes e7, gets back rank mated to queen to b8 check. Black probably didn't see that or else he wouldn't have allowed this. He puts the rook right back. Now white's making progress. He attacks that pawn on g7. Black says that's my only really good way to guard it. He could also play queen f6. If he, yeah, he could also play, uh, I guess he can't. I guess that's his only really good way. Queen d4. White says, if you trade rooks, I'll take and mate you in two. Black says, of course I can't do that. White says, I'll hit the queen. The engine says, Rook f5 was mate, threatening queen f7 check and then a back rank mate. He's still threatening queen f7 check with a back rank mate. Black plays there to pin the rook so that there's no back rank mate. White checks. The king goes there. And now the problem is that the rook is pinned. So white simply says, I'll get out of the pin. And now if black plays queen e1 check, then rook f1 threatens both the queen and queen f8 and mate. And therefore... Black resigns. All right, so today we've talked about hand waving, or as Coach Jander called it, uh, telling a story. We don't want to tell stories. We want to do very specific analysis. If you say, well, my visualization is not very good, then the answer is, well, but the more specific analysis you do, the, the better that skill gets practiced, and you start to get a little bit better and a little bit better at it. Or you might say, my chess logic's not very good. I can look two moves ahead, but I'm always looking at the wrong moves, and that's not what happens in the game. Well, again, your experience, your practice doing this, your talking to other players, analyzing with good players, watching videos like this and analyzing. The more you analyze with good players, the more you practice analyzing yourself, the more you get better at looking at the pertinent lines and the lines that might actually occur and not the lines that are ridiculous. You never assume that your opponent's going to make a terrible move. When your opponent does move, it's okay to assume it might be a mistake and try to figure out if you have a tactic. But when you're analyzing, you don't do that. When you're analyzing and it's your move and you and you say, if I go there, where is he going to go? You have to assume his best moves. You can't say, well, if I attack his queen with a pawn, he's just going to let me take it. So therefore, attacking with a pawn is a great move because then he won't move the queen and I'll be up a queen. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So you can't analyze that way. All right, thanks for watching the video. Tell your friends about the channel. As I said, you can subscribe, you can like the video, and we will see you next time. Bye.